Final week on the series we've called Heart of a Servant. First week we talked about Jesus taking the towel and not leaning on his title. Did you take uh, the towel? Do you still have your towel? hope that you do. I, I, I've seen a couple of places. I'd love to see it. Why don't you post it or something and tag me in it and show me where you put uh, your towel, maybe over your office chair in your office or, or maybe if your kid's going back to school, uh, a couple of weeks from now we have back to school weekend. We'll pray for all of our kids going back, but maybe put it in their backpack or something and Send it like a prayer cloth with them. And then last week, we, uh, we talked about the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan. Three viewpoints of serving. The priest comes by. He says, I just can't get involved. The Levite comes by and says, I want to be informed, but I don't, I just, I'm not going to get involved. And then the Samaritan, what we now call the Good Samaritan, comes by and says, I have to get involved. Amen, everybody? i got to do something about it. And um, I'm going to give you the final message uh, in this series today. Uh, and I'll do my best to get you out on time. But if it's raining really bad, you're going to stand in the lobby anyway. You know what I mean? So you might as well stay here and listen to me if I go late. <laughs> All right. Um, I've been in ministry this year 25 years. Um, Brandy and I have been married 25 years. We jumped right into ministry. Uh, next year, I'll celebrate our 25th uh, year together uh, married and our 25th year in ministry together. And in 25 years, I get a lot of hard questions uh, as a pastor. I get questions about... Uh, what am I supposed to do about a job or what, what do I do about a relationship? By the way, I can go ahead and give you some of the stuff, you know, so we don't have to meet about it. Uh, if she's not in church or he doesn't tithe, it's a no. Can I get a good amen, everybody? Like, it's just a no. Um, whatever bait you catch him with is the bait you're going to have to keep catching him with. That's good preaching, isn't it? Isn't it? I'm already good. This is all good. But anyway, I get questions about that all, all, all of the time. Uh, there are hard questions uh, uh, about what to do in life. I love when our high school graduates come, you know, at graduation season, and I ask high school graduates, what are you going to do now after high school? You know, what, what do you do? And it's such a hard question. There's really only two answers. You, you know, they either answer really fast, and they say, man, I know what I'm, you know, I'm going to the University of Arkansas because I want to be successful in my life, and I want a good job, and I want to win. And so I'm going I'm to go to the, or it's, it's, it's either that, like they got a plan, I'm going to be an engineer, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to do this. Or they look at you like a deer in the headlights and they say, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't even know when graduation is. <laughs> you know, like, I don't even know what high school I went to. I'm not even sure I'm graduating. I, th those are the only two things. It's a hard question. Like when you get to the end of your high school career about what you're going to do with your life. Um, Brandy and I, I told you, have been married 25 years. We've had a lot of questions. We certainly hadn't figured it all out. Uh, we're still learning. Uh, if a man ever tells you he understands marriage, uh, he's a liar. Uh, he's lied to you. Uh, so we still have a lot uh, of things to work on. Uh, we have a lot to grow in. But by far, uh, over the last uh, two and a half decades, uh, we've faced one hard question that consistently comes up. Uh, it is, I think it's the hardest question in marriage. And it's this, uh, what are we going to eat? What are we going to eat for lunch? Does anybody know what I'm talking about in this? Like, this is the heart. What do you want to eat tonight? What do you want? Just tell me what you want. I don't care. You pick. Okay, I pick tacos. Mm. <laughs> we could have avoided all of this if you would have said out loud what you wanted. Yeah, but anything's fine. Okay, let's go get burgers. <laughs> we just had burgers. Okay, this is not going well. This is the, I'm telling you, by far, it's the hardest question we, we face is what do you want? What do you want to, we'll do it for lunch today. I'm like, we eat lunch every single Sunday. We could probably pre-plan this. You know what I mean? Like there's 52 of them. We could just draw something out of a hat, but we won't. We'll go to my office and we'll say, what do you want uh, to eat? It's the hardest question in marriage. The hardest question by far in pastoring that I get, almost all questions actually have one root and it's this. What, do, what, what am I supposed to do with my life? Like, what does God really want out of my life? Like, what am I supposed to really be doing? When you ask a relationship question, you're really asking, what's my future look like with this person? When you ask a job question, you're really asking, what do I do? You know, is, is this career going to lead me in the right path? When you ask a college question, it's really about, is this going to be the right path for me? Most all questions I get as a pastor, the, I think the biggest question most people have, maybe you're in church today or if you're uh, at church online today, I think the biggest question people have is, what do I want out of life? What do I want out of life? Like, what am I going to do with my life? What's God really want out of my life? If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, 
Write this down anyway. God's ultimate plan for you is a life of, everybody say fulfillment. Come on, everybody say fulfillment. Fulfillment. God's ultimate plan for your life is a life of fulfillment, satisfaction, contentment, fulfillment. That you're filled up with purpose and destiny and calling in your life. God's ultimate plan for your life is not fun. I know there are people who like to have a lot of fun, and maybe you know somebody married to somebody related to somebody that thinks God's ultimate plan for me is to have a good time. And as long as I'm having a good time, come on, I'm not here for a long time. I'm just here for a, a good time. Come on, I, like I just, I, I just want to have fun. God doesn't make your life fun. That's not the ultimate plan for your life is one thrill to the next thrill to the next thrill. God's ultimate plan for your life is not your family. And I, lo- I want you to love your family. As a matter of fact, in our lives, we've decided, and I think it ought to be for you, the number two relationship in my whole life. Next to my relationship with God is my relationship with my family. If I lose at home, I lose. Men, look at me. If we lose at home, we lose. Say amen to that. We lose. And I, I love y'all. I really do. I love you very, very much. But I do not love you as much as I love Brandy, Hazel, and Henry. And I'll leave you jokers for them in a heartbeat. Y'all be looking around like, where did he go? He went to fix him and his family. Are y'all with me, everybody? Because if I lose them, it doesn't matter if I win you and lose them. I got to go to heaven and answer to God how I lost them and won you. But God's ultimate plan is not for my family. God's ultimate plan is not for me to make money. Now, I'm not telling you money's wrong. As a matter of fact, you're in a church that believes God wants to bless your life. I think you ought to be successful. I think you ought to have money. I think you ought to leverage everything that you have for the kingdom. I think God blesses you so that you can be a blessing to others and you can further kingdom purposes. But God's plan and ultimate goal for your life is not money. God's plan for your life is not happiness. Well, God just wants me to be happy. Not true. Well, God, if God wouldn't do this, if he, if it wasn't going to make me happy, no, that's not true. God's ultimate plan for your life is not happiness. When you lay your head down at night, God's ultimate plan for your life is when your head hits the pillow, you know that you know that you know whether I have enough money, whether I have my family right, whether everything's right in my finances, in my career, whether I'm happy or I'm sad, depressed or lonely. When I lay my head down at night, I know that I know that my life may a difference today, that I'm living in my calling, that the purpose of God is welling up on the inside of me. And when I get up tomorrow, I'm going to keep walking in that purpose. That is God's plan for your life. It's not to make you happy, wealthy, rich, good looking. Not everybody can be short and good looking. Not everybody, some people are tall and ugly and that's, I, I, I can't help you with all of that, but it's, God, God, that's not God's plan for your, God's plan for your life is that you live a life of fulfillment. God wants you to live life to the full. God wants you to fill you up, listen to me, with so much purpose and so much satisfaction that you don't live your life chasing cheap substitutes to fill your life with. Say amen to that. God wants to put so much purpose and calling on the inside of you and so much fulfillment and satisfaction on the inside of you that you don't live your life chasing sex or chasing money or chasing sin or chasing status or chasing bigger houses or nicer cars or pride or the approval of men. God wants you to get up every day so satisfied that I know that I know that I'm living in my calling and I'm on purpose and my life made a difference today and I'm fulfilled that you don't spend 20, 30, 40, 60 years years of your life chasing the wrong thing, chasing the wrong thing only to get to the end of your life and realize it's still not enough. I'm still not happy. I've met people with money who are still not fulfilled. I've met people with good families who still aren't fulfilled. I've met people who are single who aren't fulfilled, married who aren't fulfilled, people with nice trucks and nice ranches unfulfilled, people who have climbed the corporate ladder not fulfilled, people with education and more degrees behind their name than a thermometer and unfulfilled. Because your life isn't about 
your happiness and your achievements. My life is God. What do you want for me? What do you, what, how can you fill me up? John 10 and 10, Jesus said, this is the purpose that Jesus came for. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, my purpose, here's why I came, is to give you life and that to its fullness. A full life. You're supposed to be a fulfilled person. And I'm dedicating this message to people today who feel the weight of unfulfillment. Who have on the outside what seems to be enough. Some of us more than enough. I got more than enough. I'm blessed. I got good kids. I, I got a good house. We got a good income. I got my health. I, I, I've got, we've got, on the outside you could see, man, that looks like success. That looks like enough. But when you lay your head on the pillow at night, you think to yourself. As salty tears run into your ear holes, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. I want to teach you today about the unlived life that you were made to do something for God. That you were made to live your life. You were created by God to accomplish something. Listen, and you were made to accomplish something that was decided before you were decided. Let me teach this to you. The Bible said that he has created us anew in Christ Jesus to do good works that he planned for us long ago. Let me say it like this. God did not create you, look at you, and then go, what do I want them to do? God didn't look at you and go, look at that little lovable furball. Look at that little thing. What can I do with him? What can I do with this guy? What could be the purpose of his life? No, no, no. The Bible says he pre-planned something for you to do, and then he created you and put you with that plan. In other words, God has something. The Bible says every day of your life is written in his book before one of them came to be. You didn't, you, you didn't come into this world and then God goes, well, let's see what I can do with him. No, no, no. God already knew what he wanted to do with your life and the call of God on your life and the purpose of God on your life and the gifts he was going to give you and the opportunities you were going to have and the talent God was going to give you and the blessing you were going to do. And most people spend their whole lives searching here and there and chasing something that isn't actually fulfilling. And you're supposed to pursue that project that you've been dreaming about and you're supposed to finally start that diet. Come on, everybody. No, there's a Monday coming somewhere. You know, that you're, supposed to start, you're supposed to finish that degree. You're supposed to learn how to play that instrument. You're so finally supposed to address, address that family of addiction and habit, that, that cycle that keeps coming. You're finally going to commit to a local church and get involved and not just scan churches all around town. You're supposed to finally write that book, write that song, start that business, watch it grow, start that ministry, see it thrive, open your house. You're supposed to do something with your life, but most people don't. Here's why. Write it down. If you don't have a target, you'll hit it every time. If you don't have a target, you'll hit it every time. If you, if you, don't, if you don't know this is the fulfillment of my life. This is the destiny God has for me. Then you never can miss. You ever met people that are never wrong? Look straight ahead just in case you're married to them. <laughs> you know, I, I want you to go home with the same people you came with. So it, they're just never wrong. They just, you know, they, listen, this, this is the way I like to illustrate it. They pull the bow back and the arrow hits the wall and then they walk to the wall and draw the bullseye. They never miss. The problem with never missing that way is you know you're the only one that sleeps with you. You're the only one that closes your eyes at night and knows this isn't enough. This isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. There's got to be more to my life. And even if they discover their calling and they have a sense of what it is, few people actually live 70, 80, 90 years of their life living out their call. And here's why. I think I know why. Let me give you at least three reasons why people don't step into a life of fulfillment and purpose and calling. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. We let our past stop us. Right? We, we just decide from the beginning that I've done too much, gone too far, seen too much, been too bad. There's no way God could use me. I've done too much in my life. I'm, I'm still struggling with my yesterday. I'll, crippled by my past mistakes. I feel unworthy and unable to do what God's put in my, there's no way God could use me. 
There's no way God could use a country boy from eastern Arkansas. I, I have to confess to you something I don't do very often, but would you let me be vulnerable with you just enough and not judge me to tell you this, that every time, not one time, not occasionally, but every time I step on this platform and walk up those three stairs, I hear the voice of the enemy that says, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are, country boy from eastern Arkansas? No formal education, no seminary degree. I'm fourth generation raised in a spirit-filled church like this, but in four generations on both sides of my family, I'm the only preacher. Never had one minister in my family on either side, four generations deep. And I hear the enemy tell you, who do you think you are? Why do you think God could use you? Surely, knowing you, you know you more than anybody else knows you. And you disqualify ourselves by saying, I'm damaged goods. I just can't be used by God. I've done too much. If God knew, if people knew, if anybody knew really where I came from, there's no way God would pick me. And David feels the exact same way. David writes in Psalm 38 and 4, my guilt has overwhelmed me. Like a burden too heavy to bear. David said, you don't know what I've done. Like I've messed up so bad, there's just no way, God. You chose the wrong guy. Like I, I, I just, I just I, I've done too much. I, I've gone too far. I, man, that, that, that divorce, that mess up, that, that mental health struggle, that, 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 that abortion, that, 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 that foreclosure, that I just, I've done too much. God, you don't know. Maybe you, maybe you do know, but you picked the wrong guy. I've just, I've gone too far and my guilt overwhelms me, David said, and I just feel stuck where I currently am. Surely this isn't it. Verse six, David continues. He said, because of all of that, I am bowed down and I'm brought low. I just decided to live my life down here because I can't get out of this. I've just done too much. I've just, been, I've just been too bad. I've just had too many issues. I just come from the wrong side of the tracks. I just come from the wrong side of town. I just didn't come from the right pedigree. There's just no way God could use me. Listen to me. Look into my eyes. You will never see your future until you finally settle your past. You will never see your future until you finally settle your past. We have to decide that I can't go backwards, but with God, there's always more on the horizon. The best is always yet to come with God. Say amen to that. Come on, say amen to that. That your past does not disqualify you from your future. As a matter of fact, I would argue in that book that more people carried a past into their future. More people come from bad. More people come from broken. More people come from messed up and problems than people that come from good homes and good upbringing. If you got a past, you are right, primed for God to use. But we sit this one out. And we say, I just can't get past my past. You can. Let me tell you how. I think the best way to get past your past is with other people. I don't think you can get past your past all alone. I think you need somebody else. That's why James 5, 16 says to confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be, everybody say healed. That healing is not just physical healing. That healing is I finally settled the thing that I've carried with me this long and now I can move forward into my destiny because I've settled my past. But you can't do that alone. You can't lay hands on your own head, the Bible says in James 5, and just, and just get, get past your past. You can lay hands on your head and get past COVID. But you can't lay hands on your own head and get past your past. you got to confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. And then real healing comes in your life. Shout amen to that. That's why I want you in a small group. That's why spiritual family matters. That's why this fall we're going to launch the more, most small groups we've ever launched in the history of our church. That's why I want you in a freedom small group this fall. We're launching a freedom small group. You need deliverance and freedom from your past. You can't carry the scars of abuse and molestation and trouble and divorce and upset and bankruptcy and expect it to just go away by willpower. You need somebody in your life to grab you by the hand and say, I've come through this and you can come through this too in Jesus' name. Say amen to that. 
We let our past cripple us. Here's the second reason. I think people don't walk into fulfillment. They don't walk into all that God has for their life because we let the world define who we really are. We let substitutes and counterfeits and Satan's plan define who we are. You're just a nobody from nowhere. You're just a nobody from nowhere. You come from nothing. You may hear the voice of a mother who abandoned you in your head. You may hear the voice of a father who abused you and locked you in a closet in your head. You may hear the voice of an ex-spouse who told you you're fat and ugly and you'll never be anything. You may hear the voice of an old boyfriend telling you you're too stupid to ever get out of this. You may hear the voice of somebody in your head. We let the world define us. If that's who they say I am, I guess that's who that. I guess that's who I'm just supposed to be. We let counterfeits and and substitutes and Satan's plan to find who we are. And we care more about what other people think about us than what God thinks about us. It's why, listen to me, let me help you through some language going on in the world right now. I'm not a current events kind of preacher, but I got to teach you this. It's why we stand against something like critical theory as a demonic theory from hell. Here's the reason why, because critical theory that's being pushed in our education system and on our college campuses and in the news media and in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, the reason why we stand against all of that demonic activity is critical theory tells you that you're either born oppressed or an oppressor, that the pigmentation of your skin color determines your worth. Look at me in the eyes. It doesn't matter how dark a light you are or what side of the tracks you were born on. You are made in the image of Almighty God and you can be everything God called you to be. You are not a victim to your skin or your color or your neighborhood or your daddy or your mama. You are a child of the Most High God. And you're called and you got purpose and destiny on the inside of you. Don't let the world tell you you'll never be. You'll only always be this. We worry about what everybody else thinks. Galatians 1 and 10 says, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Where's all the people pleasers? Where y'all at? Some of you aren't. You just raised your hand because you actually are a people pleaser. You're like, "Ah, I'm going to help him out. Let me raise my hand. (laughs) Am I trying to get God's approval? Am I trying to please men? Watch this. I didn't say this. The Bible said, this has been in your Bible since the day you bought it. (laughs) Look at this. It... (laughs) If you're still trying to please men, watch this. You can't be a servant of God. If you're still trying to please that voice of an unpleasing mother. If you're still trying to win the approval of that husband who walked out. If you're still trying to win the approval of that spouse who beat you down and You just can't ever do what God called you to do. At some point, you're going to have to decide. Then I'm going to go back to God. I I, I say it this way. Write this down in your notes. I'm going to let the one who designed me define me. Write that down. Let the one who designed you define you. It's why I love an event next weekend. Next Sunday night, August the 4th at 5 o'clock, we have an event called Welcome Home. It's, it's our new members uh, dinner. We serve dinner and child care and all that. And you'll hear our vision and values. I actually teach it. I'll teach it next Sunday night. I've taught probably a thousand or, or more, but probably thousands of people. I've taught this particular class to it. It, it. it introduces you to our church. You can become a member, get on the team, but that's not the best part. I mean, I love that, but it's not the best part. The best part is right in the middle of it, we have a lab where you take a spiritual gift assessment. And it's 72 questions. I know that sounds like a lot. And you're thinking, man, I hate tests. I ain't good at tests. I ain't doing that. But it's real fast. It's five, six, seven minutes. I mean, it's rapid fire. But you get to the end. Listen, listen. And we don't tell you what it is God called you to do. We just tell you, look what God put on the inside of you. I think it's the best thing we offer you as a church. Look how God created you wonderfully, fearfully, and wonderfully made. Look at the gifts and talents God put on the inside of you. Why? Because I'm not going to let the world tell me who I am and who I'm not. I'm going to go back to the one who designed me. And I'm going to let him tell me what my life really means. Here's the last reason. I think people don't walk into purpose. 
Honestly, I think this is probably the biggest. We just tried to do it all alone. I, 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 really, um, I really mean this with all of my heart. I didn't put it on the screen, but I think you ought to write it down. that Faith in Jesus is a personal decision, but it is not a private decision. Right? It's personal between you and the Lord, but once you make that decision, it's got to... It's got to involve more people. It's, it's why I, I have done this over the last four and a half years. I don't, I don't have to do it anymore. But I repent to you. None of us really knew or learned or we didn't really know what was going on in COVID. And we all just kind of did what we had to do, you know. And I looked at the camera and I said, man, don't worry about it. We're going. But I'm making a commitment to you now. This is pretty bold and I got members of my board of directors in this service so this is pretty bold to tell you but I've I've told you this before and I mean it come hell or high water COVID 24 or 25 or 29 or 30 or whatever they do we will never be alone again we're going to gather as God's people every six days we're going to get together as God's people I may preach from a jail cell to you and we'll stream. (laughs) Y'all get together while I'm there. Get some bail money together. Get a brother out. Because I saw people leave. Good people. Christians. They tried to do it all alone. They lost their marriages and some of them there minds because we're not meant to do this alone you're not meant to discover your purpose alone you're not meant to you're not meant to find fulfillment alone I'll show it to you in the Bible Ecclesiastes 4 and 8 I love this verse there was a man who was all alone he had neither a son or a brother I don't have time to teach this to you but that language is important because you got to have somebody beside you and you got to have somebody coming after you a son or a brother And there was no end to his toil. Watch this. Yet, he laid his head down every night and couldn't be content. Now, it wasn't that he didn't have money. It's that he didn't have anybody. There was a man who was all alone. That's why the Bible uses inclusive language when it talks about the church. We're the family of God. We're the fellowship of believers. We're the body of Christ. We have many parts. We're the flock of our shepherd. We are not supposed to live. And you can live your whole life. Watch this. You can live your whole life searching and clawing and never finding fulfillment. You can have a lot of motion in your life. But until you get together with God's people, you're never going to move your life forward. I'll, 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 I'll close with this and, and, then, and then I'll be done. I've preached this to you before. I've got to preach it to you again, but I think God has always had a plan for humanity. I think it shows up all in the Bible, but I think it first showed up at the Exodus. If you're new to the Bible, the children of Israel have been captive for 430 years in Egypt. They've become a great nation, and God in Exodus five, 4 and 5 calls Moses, Exodus 6, uh, God gives Moses a plan. Watch this. Look at, don't miss this. If you missed everything else, don't miss this. God gives Moses a plan, uh, and he tells him, go tell Pharaoh to, right, I thought one of y'all were going to sing it, but you're not. Anyway, <laughs> Pharaoh, Pharaoh, anyway. Sunday school, anybody know this? Yeah? All right, good, yeah. I, I read it again this morning. I read Exodus 6 all the way again. One of the things I love about God is when Moses starts telling God why he can't do it, you know, I stutter. He actually said, I'm uncircumcised in my mouth. In other words, you formed me wrong. And and God, the next verse, God says to Moses and Aaron, I love that. As soon as Moses has an excuse of why he can't, God puts somebody with him. And he says, Moses and Aaron, I want you to go tell the people of Israel that that they're going to be free. And I want you to go tell Pharaoh he's going to let everybody go. And this is it, Exodus 6 and verse 6. He, he, God tells Moses, go tell the people this. Therefore, say to the Israelites, these are the four I wills. Now, the reason that matters to you and I is because when we get born again, we become part of the family of Abraham. 
We become part of the Israelite family. You know that, right? We are grafted in. We didn't replace Israel. We're brothers and sisters with Israel. That's good theology. Say amen to that, everybody. The reason we pray for the peace of Jerusalem is those are our spiritual brothers and sisters. And so goes the family. So goes all of us. Can I get a good amen, everybody? That's why we're always going to stand with Israel. Because this promise that belongs to them belongs to us. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, for I wills. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will free you from being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Now all three of those are about you. You get out of Egypt. You get free from slavery. You get redeemed. And then the fourth I will, God says, I will take you as my own. I'm going to put you together. And then I'll be your God. Write it down like this and then close your Bibles. You are not called. God never promised to make you a fulfilled person. He promised to make you a fulfilled people. God never promised to make you a fulfilled person. He promised to make us a fulfilled people. Ultimate fulfillment comes first when you get together with God's people and you realize that I'm living on purpose together. Together we're changing the world. Together we're lifting lives in our community. Together we're bringing hope to single mothers. Together we're being salt and light in a dark culture. Together we're the church of Jesus Christ. Together we're difference makers. And then he says, if you'll get together with a group of people, if you'll get on a team, if you'll get in a group, if you'll be in spiritual family, I'll take you as my own people and then I will be your God. Ultimate fulfillment, write it down. Ultimate fulfillment comes when you're a part of a family. It's making a difference. Why? Because God is on your side. And if you've been trying to find fulfillment in your life by yourself, I want you to know this is the answer to the biggest question you have. What does God want? He wants you to be with family. Who's making a difference. Because God's on your side. Close your Bibles. Look at me in the eyes. Because God's on your side. This is what I want for you. Matter of fact, we've arranged our whole church around this. This is real revival, by the way, is when God's people say, we're not going to let divisions, and oh, no, we're going to be unified. We're going to make a difference together. We're not just going to curse the darkness. Don't be surprised. L- l- let, me, let me help you as a pastor, give you some language. Don't be surprised at the opening ceremonies of the Olympics when devils act like devils, right? Don't be surprised by all of that. That's the world being the world. What shocks me is when Christians don't act like Christians. Because they don't mind showing off who they are. So this month in revival, we're just going to show everything we are. We're going to be a praying, worshiping, Jesus exalting, spirit filled church. We're going to be the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're the family of God. And if if you're looking for fulfillment, you can find it in family. That's making a difference. I think this is a great one, by the way because God's on your side. Bow your heads for prayer all over the house. If you came to church today and you know the feeling of emptiness. Oh, it looks full. I mean, your life looks full on the outside. If you, if you, if, if you were to just measure in dollars and cents and acres and fences, trucks and horses and clothes and stocks you you could say man it it looks full from this but if you know that you know that there's just something more you're the only one that lays your head down at night closes your eyes and says there's got to be more to this life than this then I'm dedicating this prayer to you and if it is for you why don't you just open your hands before the Lord and just say okay God I, I, I surrender here I am I've been trying to do this on my own for me by me And now I just, I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to finally give in and say, God, I got to come back to you. I've let the whole world tell me who I am and what I am and how I am. But I've let my past kind of cripple me and disqualify me. But you didn't disqualify me. God, you you didn't say I wasn't worthy enough. So today I just, 
I just decide I'm going to believe what you say. I'm, I'm going to give my life to Jesus today. I'm going to, I'm going to follow your prayer. I'm going to live fulfilled, satisfied, and full because I came back to the one who created me anyway. I'm going to start living my life on purpose. I'm going to start giving and serving and showing up and inviting and bringing and not passing by somebody in the ditch. I got to get involved. I got to do something. I'm going to get in spiritual family. I'm going to stop shopping for family and I'm going to actually commit to spiritual family. Real relationship. I'm going to actually get in a group. I'm going to actually go to next steps and get on a team. Not because the church needs me, but because I need it. I need purpose. What I'm doing is not really fulfilling me, but if I get with family that's making a difference, God's on their side. I want to be on that side. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Stand up, everybody. Don't move. Just stand. Stay in this posture of prayer. Why don't you look at me in the eyes? If you're here today and you need to come home to God, this service, we, we orchestrated the whole service for this moment. We knew you were going to be here. We knew you needed the Lord. You see, I I really believe people want to serve God. I actually believe you want to go all in with God. You just feel guilt and shame. And the devil just constantly reminds you of why you can't, you shouldn't. doesn't work that way. But I came today to tell you the devil's a liar. He's a liar and the father of lies. That you can start over with God today. If you're far from God, if you're lost and you know you are, you've never given your heart to Jesus, it's as simple as a prayer of surrender. Now, the life after that, nothing but simple. <laughs> it's, it's, they're not, everything is going to cost you your whole life, but it can start in a simple prayer. If you're a Christian today and you're cold and far from God, if you know that you know that you've let separation come, God didn't move, you did So just come home today. Just start over right where you are. Come back to God today. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I can't pray it for you, but I'll give you some words to use. As a matter of fact, our whole church, bow your heads and close your eyes. Nobody looking around. But I tell you what, I I rarely ask you this. This is very out of character for me, but I just want to know who I'm praying with. If you need to come home today, would you just raise your hand and say, it's me. I'm, I'm going to give my life to Jesus, rededicate my life to Christ today. Thank you. I see you. Thank you. I'm going to give my life to Christ today. I need to come home. I need to, I need to make it right. I know that I'm separated from God. I know that things are not right in my life. This prayer is for you. So out loud, everybody praying, say, Lord Jesus, thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying for me. I believe God raised you from the dead that I could have eternal life and I could have abundant life. So I repent of my sins. I give you my past, my hang-ups, my sin, my choices. I give you my future, my hopes, and my dreams. Save me today. Cleanse me today. Forgive me today. Make me brand new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Here it comes, just between you and the Lord. I give you my whole life. Come on, say it like you mean it. I give you my whole life for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. And everybody shout amen. Come on, give God praise for his word today, everybody.